Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to Boundary Break, the show where we basically take a camera anywhere we want to try and find secrets and discoveries in some of our favorite games. I'm your co-host Snipey, and with its recent VR port and even recenter remake announcement, there's probably no better time to take a peek at Resident Evil 4, and where better to look than where the game originally debuted, the GameCube. But before we do that, first a word from our sponsor. Do you want to shave your body? 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 No. <laughs> Has this ever happened to you? Well, don't fret now, partner, because Manscaped has got you covered. And with the Performance Package 4.0, you'll have everything you need to deck the halls just in time for mistletoe season. Both the Lawnmower 4.0 and the Weed Whacker feature skin-safe technology to help protect your most delicate presence, ensuring that you aren't cutting it close at the most desperate of hours. <laughs> and with the LED light on the lawnmower, you'll be lighting the way like Rudolph. There's plenty of additional stuff in the kit too, like the Crop Preserver Deodorant and Crop Reviver Toner, with vegan ingredients that will make your sack smell a little less like the Grinch. Santa cares about his sack, and you should too. So go to manscaped.com and use code she says for free shipping and 20% off. You heard that right. 20% off and free shipping by using she says at manscaped.com. Manscaped, don't put any old razor down there. Thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring this episode of Boundary Break. I think it's only fair that we start off this episode with our first viewer request. And it's one that I was wondering too. Where does the dog go after you let it out of the bear trap? And the unfortunate truth of it is, it scampers off into the trees and just fades out of existence. We can see the same thing with some villagers a little bit afterwards. One of the most intriguing things that Resident Evil 4 does is it has most of its UI existing in the game world. Now this does encompass a lot of stuff, but I do want to point out individual examples of this. Pre-rendered cutscenes? You betcha. Move the camera around, they're playing right in the world with nothing else around them. The chapter end screens, same thing. They fill right to the edge of the screen, with almost no spillover unless it's an animated graphic where they have it slide in from the side a little bit. Even the pause screen gets involved. But this goes far beyond what you'd expect, because this goes for everything that can move and animate. I'm not sure if this is an engine limitation or a developer idea, but every element of the screen that is not text since text doesn't need to move, is part of the game world in some capacity. Button prompts, especially, being the most surprising one, with a little flashing, oh, press this button now! That's part of the game's UI that's parented to the camera object that you control as you play. And you'll see it throughout the rest of the footage, but I do want to point it out now. The black bars at the top and bottom of the screen are part of the game. And then outside of these bars, you have little colored squares that I believe are giving some sort of developer info of some kind, or are used for the animated statuses, like for your health or something. And the thing with this letterboxed area is this is where every screen that you see will be. It's also always rendered on top of stuff, so you never have anything clipping into the camera. And the commitment to having everything in the 3D world doesn't just stop at flat screens. For instance, this is what the inventory looks like. Your briefcase items, Leon, and the grid patterns are in the background, a little bit far away from the camera, but held together with force perspective, which we can attribute to the way that they have everything layered, with elements intermingling in front of and behind other things to make them look in front of and behind other objects, despite being at the same distance. Like the panel that comes in from the side with the grid. The grid is far behind it, but renders on top of it, thus looking like both are at the same level. Each different tab of your inventory is constructed in a slightly different way, but the most unique one is probably the world map because it's so much bigger than you're probably expecting but that's because it needs to hold up to close scrutiny you get to zoom in and zoom out as you please and so they decided to make it freaking gigantic and in case in your mind you're like oh could it possibly be everything in the world it is even small ui things like the scopes of rifles and the binoculars since they're not pre-rendered or anything like that it's just a full screen effect on top of the camera whether through an image or other means there's some other fun ui stuff too like the typewriter that you used to save, which looks like this from another angle. Item pickups look like this. 
and the main menu image that scrolls by looks like this. And before I show the really crazy stuff about force perspective and camera trickery, I do want to talk about the radio! Woo! Radio! So much fun. I love radio. But often your game will be interrupted by little radio calls, and you talk to plenty of characters. But, as you may have guessed at this point, they're in the game world. And while the radio screen is shared across the entire game, the characters in them are not. And each one has their own unique pose of standing. Hunnigan doesn't even have her legs, she's just a torso, and then her hands sit at like a desk. In fact, every character other than Leon doesn't have their legs. Even Sadler, whose resting pose has one of his arms inside his stomach. Leon, for some reason, is missing his hands, but still has his legs. And yes, in removing his legs, Salazar is made even shorter. In fact, he's already so short in the game that in the cutscenes where he's meant to talk to Leon over the railing, they actually have to lift him up off the ground so that he's floating. Now real quick, I'm gonna pause here just for a second, and I want you to take, take a look, take a very, very close look, and tell me what is wrong with this scene. Or tell me anything interesting, anything stand out. I'll wait. No, I'm kidding, I won't make you wait. Did you know that the water in Resident Evil 4 is flat? Yeah, that's right, the water is flat. Or more accurately, your view of the water is being reprojected onto the water itself in real time to mimic the depth of the water being in 3D. And because the camera is basically a fixed perspective, they can pull off this reprojection without any issue. As for why they'd even need to do this, I imagine it's because they wanted to have the water ripple and when you shoot it, also have it animate. And I think in order to do this, the devs decided that it would be better to have a camera effect rather than actually manipulating the surface of the water. So what's actually going going on here is pretty weird. So the best way that I can describe what's actually going on here is you have your fixed camera view, which sets the borders for the effect, which you can see on the sides where it just starts extending forever. And then from a different layer of the game camera, one where Leon has no hair and there's no actual water, it takes this view and uses it in the parameters of the cone of vision. And so as I move around, there will be a mismatch, but in the game, these line up perfectly. Basically just think of it like a movie projector, but if the video it was projecting was directly from your eyes. And so when that's overlaid on top of the water, it retains that illusion of there being stuff underneath it, since you've got the fish moving around and they jump out of the surface Service and they match their positions. This effect is very specifically tied to the camera being in an exact position at an exact time, and the moment you stray from that, it falls completely apart. And really, the only way to tell that it's even doing any of this is that you can see just the edges of stuff outside of the water inside of the water as it's rippling about, like the edge of Leon's gun or his body. This method of doing things is reused in multiple parts of the game, basically anywhere where there's water or some sort of transparent effect, like the You Died screen's blood effect effect, or explosions. And in this room filled with lava, there's this sort of foggy haze effect, and that's actually this really huge rectangle that's really far away from the player's camera that's doing the same trick. It's really weird stuff. A fun side effect of doing this means that there's no reflections in the water, even in places where there is a reflection, like inside the cathedral. It's the same method used as other water sources, so this means instead of an actual reflection, it is just a duplication of the room you're in, but upside down. But it's not always perfect. And hey, now would be a pretty good time to look at one of the viewer requests that we had for this episode, which is to look at the secret death animation by the lake fish monster thing from a different angle. So even though it's hard to read, we can get a good look at Hunnigan's badge. And most of the words aren't legible, but we can see that it's a press identification badge, with the date listed as February 2002, which could possibly be a reference to Resident Evil Outbreak, which was announced in February of 2002, but I don't really know. With Resident Evil 4 being an older title on older hardware, developers really had to take into consideration what was being displayed on screen and how much processing power they really had. And so Resident Evil 4 is really efficient at having more complex objects pop in and pop out as you look towards or away from them. And depending on your angle, it can include entire portions of levels, or if you're in a boss arena, the arena itself. Somebody wanted to know, does the chainsaw guy have a face? And you'll be happy to know that he does.
But Resident Evil 4 is particularly inconsistent with who has faces and who doesn't. Most enemies with masks that at least cover their mouth don't have a face, but a good portion of enemies do keep their entire face. There's this military guy with like a full ballistic mask and he has his entire face underneath it despite it not being necessary at all. In fact, most of the military personnel near the end of the game have their entire face. But then you'll have examples like this guy wearing a gas mask who has no face whatsoever. And then characters that you'd think would have a face don't have a face, like the hooded guys next to Salazar in this cutscene don't have a face, they just have their little mandibles and floating eyes with no head whatsoever. And then there's these hooded enemies who, while they have their entire face, also have this texture that's separate from their face that's meant to represent the shadow cast by the hood. It wraps around the head just about as far as it's visible by the player, and then also part of the neck. And for this next discovery, I of course have to give credit to SR212787, who I believe is the first recorded instance of this. But just after Mike's helicopter crashes, there's this pathway that you walk along, and off in the distance, there's a building that's sort of in decay, and taking the camera closer, and removing the fog, we can see that there's a 2D cutout of somebody wearing a green jacket that's been stored out of bounds. As for who this person is, nobody's really sure. But it's likely one of the developers, or somebody that one of the developers knows. Hopefully. Now I'm going to show you some characters and I want you to guess, do they have eyes? Feel free to play along. This dude wearing an eye patch. Does he have eyes? The answer is yes. This guy with his eyes sewn shut. Does he have eyes? No. No, they gone. They did not render eyes. What about this boss guy whose eye falls out? Does he have eyes? Yes, he keeps both his eyes. The one that falls out just mysteriously appears upon the floor. And hey, if you're wondering where everybody went when they went to the bingo party, uh, don't worry, they all go into an empty building that is just very small. It's a very small square room with nothing in it. So you're not missing out on anything. The bingo was a lie. One of my personal curiosities was wondering if items are already pre-spawned inside the objects that you break, like a box or a chest. Since when they're not in a box or a chest, you can see them pre-placed all over areas. And unfortunately, the answer is no. They're not pre-placed. They're only loaded in once the box or chest is opened or broken. In a similar manner, there's also nothing inside the giant cocoon which I don't know why I thought there would be something in there. One of the view requests of the episode was does Ashley stay loaded into the scene once she climbs into the dumpster? And yes, she does stay loaded into the scene as long as you don't move away from the dumpster, in which case she's called out of the scene just by distance. Also, since the merchant opens up his coat, the inside of his coat is fully rendered, but the objects inside his coat don't actually appear until he opens it up. So if we take a peek inside before he opens up his coat, there's nothing there. And I just felt it was important to mention that that bag that you come across in the dumpster that's writhing around, it's nothing. There's nothing inside it. It's okay. When you shoot it and it goes limp, you're not killing anything. Don't even worry about it. And continuing the theme of things just not being inside of things that they're assumed to be in, the wardrobe that Luis is banging around inside of and then falls out of is actually empty all the way up until the cutscene. He's not really in there. There's also this really weird part of the game where there's an elevator that connects one floor to another. It's completely enclosed and it has a fade between, but the elevator shaft is completely modeled, almost like they were planning on having the full animation play out, but decided sometime later in development to just fade to black instead. And of course, we have to talk about what I would consider the roller coaster sections of the game. The gist of it is you start at one end and you go down a really, really long path to the other, like when you're riding down this minecart. The entire pathway is laid out ahead of you. The whole thing's not loaded in at once, but it does load in as you move along it. And the speed greatly helps, since you're not moving that fast. In the minecart section especially, it moves between areas of high complexity to low complexity, going from small tunnels to these big, vast open spaces with a lot of detail. And while not everything is loaded in at once, the sheer scale scale of this map is incredible, especially how much is being rendered all at once, especially these huge pockets of environment. And for the jet ski portion, you can see the entire layout of the jet ski pathway all the way out into the end cutscene from this beginning point by just taking the camera up into the air. There's also this section where Ashley's driving a forklift thing, 
that goes on for quite a while actually, and this area is not exactly entirely fleshed out, but there is a lot of total area, and we can still see how the game is streaming in and out assets as you look around from this particular point of view, particularly the enemies trying to run after you. And what's funny is this efficiency with assets carries on once the vehicle crashes, with only a small section of the street still rendered in the scene, with basically the one back wall that goes on for a little bit, and a tiny section of a skybox. And I just think it's funny, but there's this really big room with a really huge drill, and it's drilling into some rocks into the floor, and underneath the floor, taking a different look at it, you can see that it's just a whole bunch of big rocks merged together, spinning constantly over and over again. And I don't know, I just, that, that really tickled me when I saw it. I figured I'd just tell you about it. Real quick, I wanted to talk about the sky boxes of the game, because typically they're actually a little bit more like sky domes but they seem to be custom shaped depending on the level. They're not usually just this huge dome that goes over the map, and sometimes they can be really small or really large. And again, they're not always a perfect half sphere. Sometimes their shapes are skewed, bent, whatever. Sometimes they're not even full objects. And in one particular cave, it's actually just a sphere. It's just a big old black sphere to represent the void. In one particular map, there are actually two different skyboxes, with one static outside skybox that's just a dome, and then on the inside, a smaller dome that spins around to look like the sky is moving. And the skyboxes of the game do this a lot, where they just spin around in a circle to be like the clouds moving around. It's pretty cool. Also, if you were to zoom out of the intro level, you'll notice that the lady that's been skewered by the pitchfork is still loaded into the scene, even if you're nowhere nearby. And I can't really fathom why, but on the dynamite tripwires, the textures appear to be flipped, with the text that says dangerous facing the wrong way, saying instead. Also, here's some exterior shots of Salazar's castle, which is pretty much only rendering the front gate and the little intro area that you walk into, with the rest of the castle being suggested through 2D textures in the background. And for this next part, I just want to show a couple of my favorite zoom outs that I got while I was getting footage. There's some really intricate environment work going on here, with some particularly awesome looking locations. Resident Evil 4 does a really good job with scale. Every location feels larger than life. And I think these zoom outs really demonstrate that. There's even this one section in a tower where you're overlooking the water, and there's a lot more water there than there is map. It extends really far, farther than the camera can even render. And here we go, time for the best part of the video, everybody. Let's go. It's the bird part. Yeah, so there's a crow's. <laughs> And while these crows don't have a lot of complexity to their textures, as they're super low res, they do have a lot of complexity to their model, even if they have just flat 2D eyes. It's rivaling the level of detail that I've seen in more modern titles, which I suppose would make them no longer low-poly birds, but I, I like the title too much, I'm sorry. We also have chickens. But where Resident Evil could have just kept it at birds, they also included other animals, like this really big cow. And bats! Which I believe I called gargoyles bats last time, which I apologize for, that's my bad. But this time they're actually bats! Whee! And these are all really detailed animals that I believe are brought to life through their animations. Heck, they even went all out with the fish, I assume because you can stuff it in your briefcase. And there's also a really weirdly animated spider. And something that I didn't expect to see is a low-poly human skull, first of its kind in my time. They're kind of strewn about the ground in one particular part of the game, but you can't really get a close look at them since you're looking through Leon. I don't know why I said it like that. But yeah, there's a low-poly skull. Awesome. And real quick, I wanted to show an example of when you go into a puzzle, say this light puzzle inside the church. I really just wanted to show how it kind of deloads everything around you. Like how for this particular puzzle, they don't even have the lights anymore. It's just like a gentle influence of light. And then the back half of the room just no longer longer exists, and Leon is nowhere to be seen. And something that I found that kind of personally shocked me, it, it's not really that exciting, but there are bullets inside most of the guns. Obviously when they shoot, they animate out a bullet, typically, and it'll spawn in once it's shot, but for a lot of the weapons, they do have ammo inside their magazines or inside the gun already, which is not consistent, but it's also not uncommon.
Now, let's take a closer look at some of the enemies that you come across in the game. So first up, we have the Ganados, and looking closer at an earlier model in the game, we can see that they're not really too far off of just normal people. Except, they look very sickly, very pale skin, lots of veins all over their body, but as far as it goes, they look like normal people. As you go further throughout the game, the enemies you come across are more parasitic in nature, and so these Ganados have glowing eyes and have parasites pop out of their head instead of dying. These parasites, by the way, are not actually inside their body until their head explodes. In which case, they're rendered into the scene and scale up to size. We also have the knight armors that come to life. They don't actually have anybody inside them, by the way. They're just knight armor, doing their thing. There's also these invisible bugs, which, once they're not invisible, we can get a better look at. Anyway, to round off the video, let's take a look at some of the bosses. And while before in a cutscene where he kills Luis, Sadler doesn't actually have any transformations done to his model, all the way up until his boss fight, which I'll try to give you a better view of here. And so pretty much all of his transformations come out of his body, with his limbs kind of fading into tentacles, and almost everything else coming out of his head, forming the rest of the monster that you end up fighting, which looks like this. And here's a closer look at that eye that's in his mouth. You can see that the eye is actually fully modeled, which, if we look at Leon or Ashley's face, isn't the case for them. Here's a better look at Mendez's transformation inside the barn, with some close-up detail shots so that you can bask in his glory. And why not give the same treatment to Salazar? And I think to end the video off, let's take a look at Verdugo here. This boss is more insectoid in appearance than the other ones, which kind of look more parasitic. This guy has mandibles and an insect-like body, save for an almost human upper face. And quite funnily, as you move about this area and he goes to attack you, he's actually in the scene once he attacks you for the first time. And he actually just hovers over you as you move through the hallway. And the tail that comes down to attack you is actually a separate model, used specifically for the tail attack. His full body comes down for his normal attack. And for some reason, and I don't know why, he just spins. I don't. I really don't know why. He just keeps spinning, and depending on where you look, he will spin faster or slower. And this is it's the funniest thing that I saw. And I'm not kidding, he will follow you for as long as you stay there until he drops into the room. He will continue to spin forever, and he can change direction. It's it's really I don't it's really funny. <laughs> Well, that about wraps it up for the Resident Evil 4 video. I hope you enjoyed watching. I enjoyed making it. If you did, please leave a like. And if you have anything that you want to say, comments, criticisms, concerns, fun factoids, corrections, there's probably going to be a few of those. Feel free, leave them all in the comments below. And whatever day you're watching this, I hope it's a great one. If you're watching this on Christmas, pretend it's a present from me. And if it's not on Christmas, you know, enjoy your holidays. Have a great time. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. See ya. Bye-bye. See ya.